Well, hello, and welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian, and you're listening to episode 424 of Sustainable Minimalists. If you just found this show and you don't know anything about it, well, this is a show about intentional and eco-friendly minimalist living. Today, I have a down and dirty intentional living episode for you, because on today's show, we are once and for all editing that happiness formula that has been fed to us since birth. And we're revising it. We're taking what recent research says happiness is and what it isn't, and we're creating and adopting in our own lives that new happiness formula. Now, happiness, it can seem amorphous and elusive, can't it? Happiness radiates from some people and is completely absent in others. Why is that? And what can we do about it? I wanted to cover this topic today because. Lately in my own personal life, I have been obsessed with my own level of happiness, or I should say lack thereof. (laughs) I always assumed I was a happy person, but it's only through paying attention to my thoughts and feelings that I realized recently, well, wait a minute, (laughs) perhaps I'm not as happy as I thought I was. I do tend to lean towards the optimistic side of things. But being optimistic is not the same as being happy, is it? And so there's also the fact that I did follow that happiness formula, the fake formula that was fed to me and you and all of us through societal norms and cultural messaging. That happiness formula is, of course, get a degree, get married, have kids, find yourself a decent job in a house, maybe in the suburbs. Happiness will find you if you just follow the formula. And while your happiness formula may look slightly different than this one, depending on your geographic location and your family values, the happiness formula here in the United States tends to be the same. Just follow the rules, follow the expected and laid out trajectory of life, and happiness will come a knocking on your door. I have all these things. I followed the formula. I was a good girl, let's say, and I'm not blissfully happy. So that tells me there's a problem with the formula. On today's show, I've gathered absolutely everything recent research has to say about the field of positive psychology, which is what makes us happy and how can we attain it. I've then condensed it into this 30-minute podcast episode so that hopefully we can all, first of all, understand what happiness really is. And key point here, understand what happiness is not, so that we can all, fingers crossed, go into our own lives and attain more of it, more happiness in our days. Because attaining happiness is a global pursuit, isn't it? To the parents listening especially, we want our children to be happy, happy and healthy. That's our main wishes for our children. But what is happiness? What does that even mean? Researchers find that people from every corner of the world rate happiness as more important than any other desirable personal outcome. And yet so many of us have unconsciously bought into the notion that happiness lies externally. It lies in stuff. It lies in circumstances. But none of that is it. And I'm going to prove it to you today. So let's talk about the benefits of happiness before we even try to define it, okay? We often seek out happiness for happiness's sake because being happy feels good, doesn't it? But there are plenty of other benefits to finding yourself in that happy state of mind. The French Enlightenment writer Voltaire really did say it best when he said, quote, I have chosen to be happy because it's good for my health. That is true. Feelings of positivity and fulfillment do seem to benefit cardiovascular health, the immune system, levels of inflammation, blood pressure. Happiness can boost your physical health. And when we're generally happy, we're half as likely to catch a cold or experience a heart attack or have some other physical ailment. Interesting, right? Happiness makes us healthier. Happiness is also linked with success across a wide variety of markers including income, relationships, marriage, and of course, work performance. Another way of saying this is that when we have happiness, we tend to have greater success in all these other areas of our life, which then in turn sustains said happiness. It's like a hamster wheel of happiness, isn't it? 
positive effects build on each other. Now, all that said, I mentioned at the outset that happiness can seem amorphous and elusive. I love those words, and it's so true. How can we define a state of being that is heavily variable based on person to person? What comprises happiness for one person is different for another, and so it's difficult to pin down, but we are certainly going to try. Let's start with the dictionary. (laughs) I love the dictionary. The dictionary defines happiness as, quote, an emotional state characterized by feelings of joy, satisfaction, contentment, and fulfillment. Happiness is generally defined in the field of positive psychology as a state that comes and goes. It's not a way of being. It's not a way of living. So for instance, we might feel happy when somebody gives us a gift, but that feeling of happiness might subside as the excitement and the novelty of the gift wears off. Or here's an even better example. Perhaps you just bought a new car. You know that new car feeling you get inside when you're riding home and your hot new wheels and there's not a speck of dust anywhere and the car has that new car smell? You're feeling pretty darn happy, aren't you? Well, once that car no longer feels new to you and it's just your car, it's just your wheels, that level of happiness diminishes. That's because happiness is a fleeting state, not a way of being. And that's the first thing I want you to learn today. There are very few people, very few mortals on this earth that have managed to obtain and hold on to happiness as a state of being. It's more fleeting for the majority of us. And so, yes, happiness is somewhat fleeting. But it's less fleeting than, say, pleasure. Pleasure is so fleeting that it's largely considered a momentary experience, like eating something delicious, a piece of chocolate, perhaps. You eat it, you experience that pleasure while you're eating it, and then the pleasure immediately fades because pleasure by nature is fleeting. In 2002, psychologist Martin Seligman published a book on happiness. It's titled Authentic Happiness, and I've linked to it in the show notes. But in this book, Dr. Seligman shared his happiness formula. It is an equation. So to my math lovers out there, you're going to love this equation. It's an equation that distills his years of research into a very practical and easy to understand formula. This formula gives the guidelines that we all need to live a happier life. And here it is. Ready? Get your pen ready. Write it down. (laughs) The secret to happiness, H equals S plus C plus V. I'll say it again in case your pen wasn't ready. H equals S plus C plus V. Now, of course, we're going to go through these variables one by one. But this is the real happiness formula. The happiness formula that Our culture teaches us the degree plus the spouse plus the good paying job plus the suburban home plus 2.5 kids plus a boatload of possessions. That happiness formula is not based in empirical research, but H equals S plus C plus V, that is based in research. So let's break it down. H, H stands for enduring level of happiness. It's different than that momentary pleasure, that momentary happiness that's more transient and fleeting. It's not a burst of happiness. It's an enduring level of happiness. So how do we get it? Well, H equals S plus C plus V. S stands for set point. Your set point is your baseline. It is dictated by your genetics. Yeah, your DNA does play a role in your level of enduring happiness. Your set point is also determined by your early childhood experiences. These variables influence your overall attitude towards life. It is largely out of your control and it accounts for 50% of your level of enduring happiness. Okay, so genetics, your early childhood, that accounts for 50% of your total happiness pie. And so going back to my car example, we can apply this set point, right? You get a new car, you got a little blip, a little burst of happiness because, hey, you got new wheels. But then after a few days, maybe a week, maybe even two weeks, that happiness recedes and you go back to your set point. This is called adaptation. 
if you're a glass half empty type of person, you're going to go, even though you have a hot new car, you're going to go back to that glass half empty baseline. Now, that does sound perhaps like some bad news, but the great news is that C and V, the next two variables, also account total for 50% of your happiness level, and they are definitely more within your control. C stands for circumstance. Circumstance is external factors, and it only accounts for about 10% of your enduring happiness, but it includes things like whether you live in a rich democracy or an impoverished country. It also includes other external factors, such as whether you have a strong social support group. Now, all of that together only accounts for 10% of your level of enduring happiness. Now, there are, I must say, plenty of external factors that have very little to no impact on your level of enduring happiness. The amount of money you make above a certain base level, which $75,000 used to be the base level adjusted for inflation, I believe it's now $95,000. Making more than $95,000 does not impact your enduring level of happiness. Again, getting that promotion, making more money may give you a spark of happiness in the moment, but then adaptation will occur and you will go back to your set point, which we just discussed. Even like really great things that could happen to you, like winning the lottery, becoming president of the United States, like serious, big, huge, life-changing moments, yes, you will feel a burst of happiness, but a burst of happiness is not enduring happiness, and you will go back to your set point. Now, this brings us to the variable that each of us can influence. It accounts for 40% of our level of enduring happiness, of our individual levels of enduring happiness, I should say, and it is the V. It is the voluntary variables. The voluntary variables of enduring happiness has everything to do with the choices we make. And I'm saying that slow on purpose because it's really darn important. A voluntary variable is choosing how you perceive the world. It's about adopting a growth mindset. It's about connecting with something bigger than you spiritually. It's about finding your purpose and living it. It's about going inside and it is entirely on each of us to develop. And we're going to talk more about this, by the way, on next Tuesday's episode. I have a meditation expert coming on. So be sure to check that out. But voluntary variables are within our control and they don't happen outside of our bodies. They happen inside. So what is the take-home message here? The take-home message is that, yes, genetics and upbringing, they do influence your happiness level because they comprise your set point. However, each of us, every single one of us listening right now, has the ability to increase their own happiness level in significant ways by focusing on those voluntary variables. And let me say here too, ancient philosophers have been studying happiness for centuries. Ancient philosophy and modern scientists, they all agree, they are all united in the hypothesis that happiness is not just bestowed on some and taken away from others. It's not luck of the draw. Instead, we can each take our happiness into our own hands and cultivate it. This is really powerful stuff. You have the choice as to whether or not you want to be happy. It's in your control. So we're going to take our ad break, but when we come back, we're going to do two things. We are going to discuss why, oh, why, if happiness is in our control, and if why, oh, why, we have every modern convenience we could ever ask for, why are we, as a collective, less happy in 2023, almost 2024, than in previous generations? That's number one. And then after that, we're going to get into some action steps. So what can each of us do to increase our level of enduring happiness by focusing on the V, the voluntary variables? We're going to do all of that and a little bit more after our sponsor break. And we're back. On today's show, we are fixing the happiness formula. And we did that before the break. H equals S plus C plus V. Now we're on to the point in the show where we get into some musings, perhaps. Why, oh, why are adults, in general, less happy today than adults in previous 
generations. Why is that the case? And before I answer that, I just want to say that when I read that, yes, indeed, adults in 2024 almost are unhappier than adults in previous generations, that was a mic drop moment for me. Like, hold up. Are you telling me that in almost 2024, where we have every modern convenience we could ever ask for and plenty of modern conveniences that we never asked for and didn't even know we needed or wanted, even in a culture in which we have effectively engineered out most discomforts, even despite all of that, we're less happy than previous generations? Say it ain't so. How on earth is that possible? Well, thanks to that happiness formula, and I'm talking about the fake formula, the fake formula being the degree, the spouse, the house, the decent job, the kids, thanks to that fake happiness formula that has been drilled into us since we were all young, uh, we all tend to have high expectations for a great life, don't we? If I just follow the happiness formula, happiness will come a knocking. It'll be at my doorstep in, I don't know, two weeks. If I just follow the rules, if I'm a good girl or boy, if I do what I'm told, if I follow the formula, happiness will find me. And yet, right, so many of us as adults, we've learned that this formula, this fake formula, it is rigged, isn't it? It's rigged by income inequality. It's rigged by systemic racism. You either, in these days, at least here in America, you either make it or you don't. And those who do end up making it, they're taking an increasingly large share as the average American gets very little and goes nearly nowhere. (laughs) I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave nearly nowhere because I think you know what I'm saying. While adolescents and young adults in their 20s, they may still think that they can make it if they follow the formula, most adults over the age of 30, 35, They realize they've had enough life under their belt, enough living under their belt that they know that the formula is rigged. And so, yes, adults in 2024 do tend to be less happy than previous generations. I should say here, too, that these days, more people do value wealth over relationships than they did previously, than generations did previously. And this can also lead to diminished happiness in adulthood. The pursuit of wealth of course, has a bunch of problems, but two in particular, the first being most people are not able to achieve it, even if they follow the formula. Second, valuing wealth will not make us happy. Studies consistently find that people who value money and fame and image are less happy than those who value community and close bonds with others and personal fulfillment and following their values. Now, part of the problem does lie in the shifting of the American dream, doesn't it? Not long ago, achieving the American dream meant having a steady job, having that family, owning that house. But thanks to reality TV, thanks to social media, thanks to the ready availability of social comparison, the American dream has really morphed before our eyes, haven't it? It's morphed into, not for me, but for a lot of people, instant fame, tons of followers, extreme wealth, being adored by millions. And even when our expectations for a good life, for the American dream, are more realistic, the more realistic version of the American dream now more likely involves a big house, a McMansion instead of a starter home, or material successes rather than a quieter family life. So the American dream has shifted in ways that are unattainable for the vast majority of us. Let's remember that research consistently finds the amount of money you make above that base level, your position at work, the number of luxury trips you take every year, all of that has very little impact on your level of enduring happiness. Yes, they will give you little blips, little bumps here or there but they are not going to impact your level of enduring long-term happiness. So what then? What do we do? What does increase our level of enduring happiness? What is in that V, that voluntary variables category that we have control over? Because remember, that V accounts for 40% of our level of enduring happiness. And so 
I have some action steps, some thoughts for all of us here. I want to say right at the outset, they're all over the map. But let's remember the two biggest ones that we have discussed on the show before. We discussed it on the well-being episode, which I will link to in this week's show notes if you missed it. But the two big predictors of well-being that also happen to be predictors of happiness are, of course, interpersonal relationships and living your purpose. And so we've talked about these on the show before. I don't want to waste your time by talking about them at length again, but I do need to mention them because they are just that important. So tip one, again, we're just touching on it, is to focus on your relationships. Don't be so quick to end a friendship over a quabble. Work to patch it up. Modern life provides less of the community interaction and fewer of the stable personal relationships that people need for happiness. There's plenty of exciting and fleeting encounters, especially on social media, right? But it's hard in 2024 to establish a stable and emotionally close adult relationship. So if you've got them, work to maintain them. That's tip one. Tip number two has to do with your purpose. And we're just going to touch on it really quick because, again, I don't want to waste your time. But find your purpose and live it each and every day. We all want to feel like we've made some sort of positive impact on the world, right? That has a lot to do with your well-being. It also has a lot to do with your level of enduring happiness. Explore what gives you that sense of purpose, and then explore how you want to pursue living that purpose. Live your purpose. It will give your life a greater sense of meaning, which will in turn increase that level of enduring and long-term happiness. Okay, so those were the two big, big ticket item tips that I really wanted to just touch on. And now we're going to go into some action steps that I have not mentioned on the show before. The first being a fun one. Find your flow. What on earth is flow? Flow is that mental state in which you find yourself fully and positively engrossed in a pleasurable activity. Okay, now we all find flow in different places. What makes me flow does not make you flow. I personally find my flow in writing, in running, in playing backgammon. And I know, by the way, that's an unbelievably specific place for flow, (laughs) but it is what it is. So writing, running, playing backgammon. I also these days am finding flow more and more in the kitchen when I'm cooking. But perhaps you find flow in completely different areas. Perhaps you find it dancing. I wish I could. I'm such a bad dancer. And I don't even enjoy it, but dancing, reading, listening to music, playing chess, playing pickleball. I don't know. But the point is, wherever you find your flow maximized, do it more, okay? Because what happens when you're in your flow state is that your sense of self, which means the state of being self-consciously a person, that sense of self disappears, at least for the time that you're in the flow state. And this is very, very similar to the idea of enlightenment that encompasses much of Eastern philosophy, which is achieved when someone learns to free themselves of themselves. So what maximizes your flow? Figure it out and then do more of whatever the activity is. Find your flow and maximize it. Another tip. There is some research that says you can change your baseline level of happiness. So that's your S. That's your set point that's determined by genetics and your childhood. You can slightly change your S by changing your physiology through nutrition and through exercise. And I'll just say this as an avid exerciser. Endorphins are real and they are powerful. Whenever I wake up in a bad mood, and that happens a lot, (laughs) Whenever negative emotions are just festering inside me and I'm cranky as all heck, the first thing I do after I have my coffee is I go get a good sweat on. And not because I want to look great in a bikini. That's not why I'm exercising. I'm exercising because I've learned over the decades that exercising moves out the negative energy and makes space for more positive energy. And so, yes, Perhaps the endorphins are giving me that short-term and not enduring happiness. I will agree with that. However, exercising is also clearing out the stagnant, stale, and unhappy emotions that are absolutely hindering me from enjoying my day to the fullest. 
So there is some research that says you can change your set state, your baseline level of happiness by changing your physiology. So focus on your nutrition if it needs some work. Focus on how much exercising you're getting if that needs some work as well. Also there, make sure you're getting plenty of sleep. Another thought here, of course, is to set and meet a goal. Now, this is a big one, and it is particularly timely as we're heading into New Year's resolution season. Research finds that achieving a goal will give us a confidence boost. It will also give us a sense of control and increase our life's purpose and meaning. And all of this, of course, are important factors in enduring happiness. So remember, there is a right way to decide on a New Year's resolution, and there are many, many wrong ways. So as a former teacher, when we were making goals for our lesson plans, our units, we followed the SMART goal framework. SMART goals, that's an acronym. The SMART goals are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. One of the biggest problems with New Year's resolutions, in my humble opinion, is that they are not timely. A year is way too long, and that's why so many of us come February, forget about our New Year's resolution. So I suggest you break down your New Year's resolution into 12 manageable chunks. Months, right? 12 months. Now, I will say here too, we will be doing a podcast-wide No Spend January. I will be talking about that more next week. But join us if you're interested. So the way it will look is January, the goal is a no spend month. And if you're with us, if you're going to join us, we're going to make that a specific and measurable and achievable and realistic and timely goal so that we all succeed, right? Because how horrible would it be if we set a goal and failed? We're going to set ourselves up for success. And so perhaps you join us, perhaps you don't. But the take-home message here is setting and achieving a goal is a powerful way to influence that V, that variable category that encompasses enduring happiness. Another thought here, live your values. This is different from your purpose. Live your values. To be happier, get clear on your values so that you can live your life according to your own principles. Now, I hear a lot from all of you with regard to our shared environmental values. Why even try? The climate crisis is so dire. The future for humanity is so bleak. Who cares if I ride my bike to work or not? It's easier to drive my car. Why bother? Why bother? I don't know hanging my clothes up. Why bother? I don't know, buying less. Why bother? Well, I say to all of that is if environmental sustainability is a core value of yours, you should live that value every single day because doing so will give you personal benefit. Even if you don't change the world for the better, at all. Even if you don't even make a single tiny little speck of a dent in the climate crisis, which by the way, you are and you will, but just for argument's sake, even if you didn't change or impact the climate crisis at all, you should still live your eco-friendly values because doing so can and will indeed increase your level of enduring happiness. So maybe don't do it for everybody else. Maybe get a little selfish and live your values for you. So that's my tip, live your values. And then finally, my final tip for you is to remember to play the long game. If you're not happy at this moment in time, remember that that doesn't tell you anything about whether you'll be happy in the future. When scientists examine the average trajectory of happiness over the lifespan, patterns do emerge. Happiness and satisfaction start off as relatively high. They decrease from adolescence through midlife. And then they rise again as we become older adults. Now, happiness does tend to peak when people reach their 60s and 70s, and that's because maturity leads to more contentment and a greater appreciation of what matters in life, like spending time with family, what really matters, right? It's not the fancy house and the boat, right? It's spending time with loved ones and helping other people. And so I want you to play the long game here. If you're not feeling all that happy right now, if you're feeling like your levels of enduring happiness are quite low, 
play the long game. Look at the trajectory of your life. Perhaps you are in midlife and you're just in the low spot. Perhaps as you enter older adulthood, your level of happiness will again rise, like it rises for many, many people. And now to take this one step further, remember, of course, like it's kind of a no-brainer, but let's just say it. What makes someone happy in their 20s may very likely not make the same person happy in their 80s. And what brings someone joy in their 70s may not have anything to do with what makes me happy as I enter my 40s. The key here is to continue observing by going inside, being internal about it, and revising what makes you happy at a given time. What made you happy yesterday may not be a long-lasting source of happiness for you as you go through the different seasons of life. And so my final word for you here today is, it seems to me that when we seek to change that V, when we seek to increase our level of enduring happiness by focusing on the variables within our control, it's really about going inside, going inside and examining how our culture has shaped the notion of happiness that we each adopt. A lot of us tend to think like, oh, I'll be happy when, or I'll only be happy if. And then we tack on some external condition that's likely outside of our control. Perhaps like, I'll be happy when I own my own home, or I'll only be happy if my family stays healthy. You add on some external condition, right? Instead of adding on that external condition, Let's leave the external world where it is because we likely can't control much of any of it. And let's go inside because inside's where we have a bit of control. So go inward. Ask yourself, do you put cultural conditions on your own happiness? And spoiler alert, we all do it to some degree. Bring those conditions out into the light. Shine the light of day on them. Because only when we shine the light of day on those conditions uh, can we start to dismantle them? So a big one for me, and this is a silly one, but like, oh, my day will only go well, or I'll only be happy today if my kids come home from school and they are in a good mood and they're not fighting. Like, I have no control <laughs> over whether they're in a good mood or not. But you know what I do have control over? I have control over whether I allow my daughter's bickering to disrupt my inner state. That's what I have control over. So that's what I'm going to choose to focus on. So that's my final word. Go inward as opposed to living externally. All righty. We will be back tomorrow for headlines. Headlines, of course, are the need to know breaking environmental headlines in 15 minutes or less. If you've never listened to a headlines before, take a listen tomorrow. Try it out. Maybe you love it. If you love it, stay with us. If you hate it, you never have to listen again. Easy breezy. I'll see you then. Reach out if you need me. Hope you learned something really darn important today that will enrich your life. See you tomorrow and take care.